Chapter 21, Concurrency Control Techniques. In this chapter, we'll talk about concurrency control protocols. We'll introduce two-phase locking protocols, discuss how timestamps can be used for concurrency control, and then briefly discuss multi-version concurrency control protocols. Before we start, what does it mean to have concurrent transactions? In our class, you've been using MySQL as a way to access your own personal database that no one else has had access to. But most databases that are used in companies for transactions will have multiple transactions happening at the same time. Think about all of the different cashiers that are scanning items at checkout in different stores. Each time an item is purchased, the inventory has to be updated. You can imagine that if multiple transactions are occurring at the same time, it might lead to errors in the database. That's why we need concurrency control. We need a set of rules that will guarantee serializability. In other words, we need a way to make sure that even though transactions are happening all at the same time, that it appears that they're happening one after the other in a serial manner. This is what these control protocols are used for. In its most basic form, concurrency control looks something like this. For each item in the database, we can have what's called a lock, or a variable associated with a data item that describes the status for operations that can be applied. Think about when you're on an airplane and different people are trying to use the restroom. There's a signifier on the outside of the door that indicates whether the restroom is available or if it is occupied. This serves as a lock for the airplane bathroom. Similarly, we have locks for different data items in the database. The simplest forms of locks are binary locks that have two states. Either the item is locked and can't be accessed, or it is unlocked and it can be accessed when it's requested. Here's a bit of pseudocode that illustrates how this type of lock might work. Here we have a snippet for locking an item, and here we have a snippet for unlocking an item. Let's take a look at the lock item first, and let's use the restroom example on the airplane. If you get up to go to the restroom and you see that the sign says vacant, you'll go ahead and lock the bathroom once you get in. And when you're finished using it, you'll unlock it again. This is a very simple method of concurrency control. In the database, you can have a table that specifies which items currently have locks. And there's also a lock manager subsystem that keeps track of and controls access to those locks. The locking rules are enforced by the lock manager module. At most, one transaction can hold the lock on an item at a given time. This preserves that serializability. But if you think about the binary locking that we just discussed, this is too restrictive for working with database items. Because if an item is locked, that means that it can't be accessed by anybody else. This is fine if we're trying to write new information to the database, but reading information from the database shouldn't be an issue if we have multiple people needing to read it at the same time. If all the cashiers need to scan an item to check the price, that shouldn't really be an issue but it would be if we only had a binary type of lock. Thus, most database management systems have what are called shared, exclusive, or read-write locks. This allows so that if we have multiple read operations on the same item at the same time, there isn't a conflict. This is what's referred to as a shared lock. But if we have to write to an item, then we have to have the exclusive lock. Instead of just lock and unlock, then we'd have three locking operations, including read, write, and unlock. The process for using the three different types of locks is a little more complicated, but not too much more complicated than using a binary lock. If we want to read an item, we check to see if it's unlocked. If it's unlocked, then we go ahead and read lock it and increase the number of current reads that are happening to that item. Otherwise, if it is read locked, we simply tell it that we're also reading it and increase the number of current reads. If neither one of these is true, we wait until it becomes unlocked and the lock manager wakes up the transaction. Then we start the process again. If we're trying to write to an item and it's unlocked, then we'll write lock it so that no one else can write to it. Otherwise, we'll wait for it to be unlocked and the lock manager wakes up the transaction and then start the process over again. In order to unlock a write locked item, we just unlock it. But if the item is read locked, we wait until the number of reads is zero and then unlock it. We have the following techniques as well. First, we have lock conversion, in which a transaction that already holds a lock is allowed to convert the lock from one state to another. We can upgrade a lock, so if we have a current read lock operation, we can upgrade to a write lock operation. 
We can also downgrade the lock, where we issue a read lock operation after a write lock operation. We can guarantee serializability in this two-phase locking. The two-phase locking protocol makes it so that all locking operations precede the first unlock operation in the transaction. We have two phases, the expanding phase and the shrinking phase. In the expanding phase, new locks can be acquired, but none can be released. Lock conversion upgrades that change read to write locks must be done during this phase. In the shrinking phase, existing locks can be released, but none can be acquired. Downgrading from a write to a read lock must be done during this phase. If every transaction in a schedule follows the two-phase locking protocol, then the schedule is guaranteed to be serializable. Two-phase locking may also limit the amount of concurrency that can occur in a schedule, and certain serializable schedules will be prohibited by the two-phase locking protocol. This is all to preserve the integrity of the data in the database. There are different variations of two-phase locking. We have the basic two-phase locking discussed previously, what's called conservative or static two-phase locking, this requires a transaction to lock all the items it accesses before the transaction begins. In this type of locking, read set and write set have to be pre-declared. This is a deadlock-free protocol. We'll talk about deadlock shortly. In strict two-phase locking, a transaction does not release exclusive locks until after it commits or aborts. In rigorous two-phase locking, transaction does not release any locks until after it commits or aborts. Within the database, there is a concurrency control subsystem responsible for generating read lock and write lock requests. Locking is something that is generally considered to have what's called a high overhead. When talking about concurrency control, we have a state that we'd like to avoid at all costs, referred to as deadlock. Deadlock occurs when each transaction is waiting for some item that's locked by another transaction. Everybody's stuck in a waiting queue, waiting for something to release and no one can get access to the resources that they need. We need to consider how to either prevent deadlock or address deadlock when it happens. For this purpose, we have different deadlock prevention protocols. We could, for example, have each transaction lock all items that it needs in advance. We could also order all the items in the database so that transaction that needs several items will lock them in a particular order. But actually, both of these approaches are impractical. What we can consider are protocols based on a timestamp, either what's called wait and die or wound wait. We could also use a no waiting algorithm such that if a transaction is unable to obtain a lock that it's immediately aborted and restarted later. We could use a cautious waiting algorithm that prevents deadlock or we could just rely on detecting deadlocks and not worry about them happening at all. We could implement something in the system that would check to see if a state of deadlock exists and use what's called a wait for graph. We could also use victim selection in which we decide which transaction to abort in case of a deadlock. We could use timeouts such that if the system waits longer than a predefined time that it aborts the transaction. Starvation occurs if a transaction cannot proceed for an indefinite period of time while other transactions continue normally. The solution to this is the use of a first come first served queue. A timestamp is a unique identifier assigned by the DBMS to identify a transaction. These are assigned in the order that the transactions are submitted and represent the transaction's start time. Concurrency control techniques based on the use of timestamps do not use locks, so deadlocks cannot occur. In order to generate timestamps, we have a counter that's incremented each time its value is assigned to a transaction. If we do use the current date time value of the system clock, we just have to make sure that no two timestamps are generated during the same tick of the clock. The general approach would be to enforce equivalent serial order on the transactions based on their timestamps. In other words, if we use timestamps to mark different transactions differently, even if they occurred at the same time, we still have the general order that they should be in. Timestamp ordering allows interleaving of transaction operations. In this, we must ensure that the timestamp order is followed for each pair of conflicting operations. So each database item is assigned two timestamp values, a read timestamp and a write timestamp. The basic timestamp ordering algorithm goes something like this. If a conflicting operation is detected, then the later operation is rejected by aborting the transaction that issued it. The schedules produced by timestamp ordering are guaranteed to be serializable, although starvation may occur. In the strict timestamp ordering algorithm, it is ensured that schedules are both strict 
and conflict serializable. There is a modification of the basic timestamp ordering algorithm called Thomas's write rule. This does not enforce conflict serializability. It rejects fewer write operations by modifying how write operations are checked for. We can also use a multi-version concurrency control technique in which several versions of an item are kept by the system. Some read operations that would be rejected in other techniques can be accepted by reading an older version of the item if we have different versions. This is how it would maintain serializability. One drawback of this method is that more storage is needed to keep track of the different versions. There are several different multi-version concurrency control scheme types. They can be based on timestamp ordering, on two-phase locking, on validation and snapshot isolation techniques. In the multi-version technique based on timestamp ordering, two timestamps are associated with each version and are stored, the read and the write timestamps. Multi-version two-phase locking includes read and write locking, but also includes something called certify. In the standard locking scheme, a write lock is an exclusive lock so that once a transaction obtains a write lock on an item, no other transactions can access that item. In the multi-version two-phase locking scheme, reads can proceed concurrently with a single write operation. This is not permitted under the standard scheme. Before a transaction is committed, it has to obtain exclusive certify locks on all of the items that it has updated. There are some additional issues to consider when discussing concurrency control. First with insertion, when a new data item is inserted, it can't be accessed until after the operation is completed. If you're going to delete an item, you must first obtain a write lock, and you might run into the phantom problem, which can occur when a new record being inserted satisfies a condition that a set of records accessed by another transaction must satisfy. The record causing the conflict may not be recognized by the concurrency control protocol. In this chapter, we've given an overview of different concurrency control techniques. If you'd like more information about the specific algorithms or about how concurrency control is affected in MySQL, please see the textbook or the links provided on Blackboard for more information.